to verse number 28. We were talking about the church that has been infiltrated, and um, certainly as I teach through the book, or through these seven churches that we find in the book of Revelation, I try to make a practical connection to um, everyday life and become aware of how this stuff might actually apply to us in the day in which we're living. And um, I would definitely say that the church at large, the body of Christ has been uh, infiltrated. There has been certainly a modern move to uh, uh, make the church more like the world around us. And uh, the spirit of Jezebel is alive and well and strong, I think, in the modern church, uh, particularly here in America. I don't know about the rest of the world. I haven't traveled a lot, so I don't know about that. Uh, but we'll talk some more about what that actually means, what it looks like in the life of the church. Um, but I want you to know that sometimes, in, particularly in our day of spiritual softness, um, we're not always wide open to the truth of God, and we're not always wide open to the reality of who Jesus really is. And we talked about this last week in John chapter 5, that the Father has given all judgment to the Son, and when Jesus returns again, he will judge all of mankind. We know that he is... Uh, currently active, you know, we, we know that he came as the Savior in his first advent, but we know according to these book or these churches in the book of Revelation that through the seasons of the church that the Lord sovereignly walks in her midst and that he deals with things as they arise. And so uh, very important for us to know, we think that because he was the suffering Savior that he'll just put up with any old thing that we throw his way in church life, but I want to tell you that's not true. Um, if you look at the seven churches uh, over in their original locations, uh, you'll see that they are no longer existent. They've been basically uh, wiped out, and their influence has been wiped out. Now, the gospel has spread, and the church continues to live on, but the reality is when a church or when a body of believers gets too far away from the Lord, the next thing you know, the world takes over, and it slowly shrivels up and it dies spiritually it might become a religious institution for a while certainly not pleasing to the Lord not honoring to God in any way and sooner or later the lamp is taken out uh, the influence is gone and next thing you know instead of being a church it's a honky-tonk you know or some some other a business or a home 
for somebody that takes over the building. And we don't want that to happen, obviously. And so we want to have ears to hear what the Spirit says uh, to the churches. Even though he's speaking to a church that was almost 2,000 years ago, around 2,000 years ago, we certainly want to hear what the Holy Spirit says to us as believers since we are the church anyway. So we talked about the Lord's perception. When we looked at verse number 18 and verse number 19, we talked about all that, how the Lord um, perception is one of, of, of a certainly thorough understanding of who we are, what we're up to. Nothing escapes his sight, right? Hebrews 4 tells us that in verse 13. I'll talk about that some more in just a moment. Uh, but when we looked at verse number 18, we really didn't get very far because I spent so much time in the introduction last time that we only looked at the beginning of verse number 18 where he talks about, he says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which has the sharp two-edged sword. And, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Pergamos, Thyatira. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, verse 18, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. We only looked at sort of that first verse, and we talked about the fact that in verse 18, that in his own introduction, it is revealing who Jesus is. It is revealing the fact that he has the divine right and the divine authority to evaluate, and then not only evaluate, but then to deal with the church as he sees fit and as he sees necessary, right? And, and so we need to be willing and submissive to whatever Jesus is doing. If our church, if your church, those of you who are watching online, is out of sync with the Holy Spirit, out of sync with the Lord, out of sync with God, then we need to be wide open to the fact that Jesus knows that and that he, as the Son of God, as the head of the church, has the right to discipline that church, to bring about a discipline to the believers, but also judgment to the unbelievers who are infiltrating and corrupting the fellowship. So we looked at all of that last week, his divine authority and how he has the right to judge the church. The second thing I see here in this verse, verse number um, 18, is that he has eyes like unto flames of fire. So the second thing we want to recognize about Jesus, beyond the fact that he's our Savior and our Lord, that he is obviously the one that we love the most, that we are endeared to as born-again believers, and we're part of his family. We also need to understand that he is sovereign in his omniscience. He knows all things. He sees all things. And here he talks about these eyes that are, have flames of fire. It reminds me of uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse number what, 14, where he talks about the eyes as being flames of fire, um, and then feet of brass in verse number 15. So there's sort of this kind of, um, he comes back to that idea here as he deals with this church in Thyatira. So we see that Jesus, in his deity and in his sovereign authority, can look into the life of the church, and he looks with an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-searching gaze. And I think that's the idea of these eyes that are blazing with fire. I think it captures the passion with which Jesus looks upon his church, the way he loves his bride. He is passionate in his devotion to her. And I promise you, he is filled with a holy passion for his church. And, and those eyes are piercing, they're penetrating, and according to these verses, they're able to try the reins of men. They're able to search out and to destroy all things that would defile the bride of Christ. And Jesus saw what was happening in the church of Thyatira, and I would suggest to you that he continues to see what's happening in the church today, right? Even when we have the same sort of characteristics as Thyatira had, set, uh, had. and he saw what was going on there as spiritual adultery. And we see that because he talks about throwing this Jezebel into a bed and all of those who have followed her teachings into a bed with her and ultimately says that he will kill her offspring, which we talked about uh, some last week. We'll talk about some more when we get there. But basically, I'm just telling you that the one who passionately looks on his church is the same one who gives this graphic warning in verse number 22 and verse number 23. I remind you again, Hebrews 4.13 says that there is no creature that is not manifest in God's sight. No one 
that is not manifest, but all are naked and open unto him with whom we will have to do. So that's just a strong warning to the church that we see in Hebrews or to those that needed to come to Christ in Hebrews. But here it's actually a warning to the church when we're looking at the verses that we're looking at here. Now, you know, as well as I do in Hebrews, he goes on to encourage us that we have a great high priest and we can run unto him in our hour of need. But that is not so for the harlot church, for those who are trying to um, carry out religion in the power of their own will and strength and, and, and to, to please God, uh, probably a false God, by the works of their own hand. None of that will uh, secure any security for them as they face this all-knowing, all-wise, all-seeing God who will ultimately deal with the problem. And I think that's what he's telling us in Thyatira. I see it, I know what's going on, and I'll deal with it. You can count on it. And, and it's sort of a, a shake-up to the church. But then notice, notice also, not only does he have these eyes that are like flames of fire, it says that his feet were like fine brass. Again, kind of like Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. And it sort of represents the power of Christ to execute judgment on whomever he sees fit. That's his sovereign will. It's his sovereign right. And it's his sovereign ability. And this idea of fine brass. Now, most people who study the scripture realize that brass is often in the Bible a symbol of divine judgment. And so he's talking about walking in the midst of a church with the attitude of divinely judging what needs to be dealt with. And so a church is not a, a place that somehow can escape the judgment of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says that it all begins in the house of God, right? Judgment begins in the house of God. So God deals with people who infiltrate the church with false doctrines, false teachings, uh, false gods, and idolatry. They enter into the church, and they begin to try to do church in that way. And Jesus said, I don't like it, and I'm willing to deal with it. And that's the, the feet of brass, where he marches through the church in judgment of those that are wicked and the wicked seed of those that she produces. In this case, it is the spirit of Jezebel. I like to remind people that divine judgment is perfect. It is perfect. When God swings the axe of judgment, he never misses the mark. Now, I've chopped a little wood since I've been up here. I've split some wood for the fire. I don't always hit the mark. And sometimes my axe will bounce off crazily and, you know, I have to jump out of the way before I hurt myself. But God never misses his mark. Divine judgment is perfectly accurate. But not only is it perfectly accurate, he always deals with those that need to be dealt with. And so what we can see when we look at this passage of scripture is that he's dealing with specific individuals. And I'll, I'll show you that some more in just a moment. Look at verse, verse number 19. It goes on to say, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Now he's talking to the church at this point when he says, I know thy works thy charity. He's talking to his children. He's talking to those that are in the body of Christ who are still committed to him. Though they may have compromised, though they may have been um, sort of lackadaisical, maybe even permissive in what they allowed inside the fellowship, they truly belong to him. And so he recognizes that. And he says, you know, I know who you are. I know exactly where you are. And I know what you're doing. I know all about you. And you can see that there in this verse where he talks about works and charity and service and faith and patience and works and all of that. He is pointing out that I know who are mine and I know what they're doing. But that I still also recognize that there's another group in the church. And so notwithstanding, here's what I have against you. Because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornications, and she repented not. So she was stubborn. She was obstinate in her uh, behavior as far as her idolatry and teaching others to practice. Verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, 
and them them who? Not the church, not the true believers, but them that commit adultery with her. So that's a group of people who have come along. Hey, we kind of like the new way the church is acting. We like what's going on. It's a lot like how we live in the world around us. It's very sensual. It's very fleshly. It's very carnal. We kind of like that. Hey, that's my kind of church. Let's go there and be a part of that. And God says, look, I know the difference. I know if it's real spiritually or if it's carnal. I know if it's real spiritually in your worship or if it's fleshly in nature. I know the difference. And all of those who get in bed with her, I'm going to judge them. So that's a different group. You see that? Even though there's the true church that he says, I know your works, patience, and all that. I also know that there is a Jezebel, and there are those who are her offspring. I, and to me, that's what I hear him saying, that I am going to judge those people, all of the phonies, all of the religious hypocrites, those who have maybe named the name of Christ, but their heart is far from God. They were never born again. They joined the church for uh, business reasons or social reasons or to assuage their own guilt or whatever. God knows the condition of your heart. And so he's warning them. So that's the third group that I see there. He says, I will kill her children with death, in verse 23, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins of the heart. And I will give unto every one of you. And I think when he says every one of you, he is referring to the Jezebel and those who follow her. You say, why do you believe that? Because he goes on to say, but, and I think that's turning back to the believer, unto you, he says, in verse 24, I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of faith, Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden but that which you have already uh what which you already have which you have already hold fast till i come and he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end to him will i give power over all nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessel uh, of the potter shall be broken to shivers even as i received of my father and i will give him the morning star he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So there's a lot of stuff just in these few verses that we're looking at. So now we've moved into verse number 19. We're talking about how Jesus doesn't you know, just ex explode in blind wrath once he finds his church, has people who are committing spiritual adultery. I mean, that's the way I'd be. Wouldn't you, as a human being, when I, when I see it, I'm going to explode. I say, how can you do that? And you need to, you know, all that. But he doesn't do that. He seems to kind of systematically deal with wrath according to righteousness. He does it justly. He does it perfectly. He does it purely. And he does it in a way that is honoring to who he is as the eternal God, right? And so we see all of that in this verse. He's very precise. He knows what's wrong with the church. He knows what's right with the church, and he can deal with both appropriately. You say, but Brother Rick, how can two cohabitate together that don't really have the same heart for God? Is it possible? Of course it is. We know the New Testament talks about wheat and tares, and we're warned it's not our job to pull up the tares. That's God's job, right? And so they, it can happen where people are going along and they sort of get it. They kind of talk Jesus. They maybe have prayed a prayer, but their heart has never uh, turned to God in, in fullness and said, I just trust what Jesus did for me. Uh, you know what, Jesus, I'll help you. I'll be religious. I'll be good. I'll obey the law. I'll give. I'll do it. And somehow I'm trusting myself instead of Christ. And that is just not the way of salvation. Christ alone, amen. Not of our works, lest any man should boast. So we, we see that in the New Testament. But did you know, I think that God talks about in the Old Testament. And I want to show you this because I think this is really interesting. And I'm not sure that God didn't just have a double entendre here where he's speaking specifically to an Old Testament group of people. And then I think it has a broader application to those of us in the New Testament, particularly as we move in towards the end of the age and the church of Thyatira rises up and eventually Laodicea comes out of that. And you, you know the progression of, of the church. But anyway, let me show you a verse. Take your Bible, open up to the Old Testament. 
and go to Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. And, and I just ask that the Lord would give you ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And tell me if this just doesn't sound like a lot of the modern church today. All right? Forget what's being said so much as the attitude behind it. All right? Although what's being said is obviously very important. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And in that day, seven women will take hold of one man. What will they say? Look, we'll eat our own bread. We'll take care of ourselves. And we will wear our own apparel. Don't tell me what's appropriate and right, what's holy and good. Don't tell me what's wicked and carnal and fleshly and provocative. Don't tell me. We'll wear our own thing. I mean, we're living in a culture that what you're wearing almost is as bad as what not wearing anything. And, and yet, there's the spirit of Jezebel that has rose up and said, you can't tell us. After all, you're a man. You don't understand. Anyway, it says that seven women will take hold of one man. I think the idea is that there are many people who will take hold of Jesus, name the name of Jesus, act like they're saved, and yet want to live their own way and say to him, oh yeah, we want your name, but we don't want to obey you. The spirit of Jezebel. We want, we want, we want the prestige that the name brings. We want the honor that the name brings. We, we want the blessings that the name might bring, but we are going to do our own thing. I think there are a lot of churches that would fit into this category. A lot of church people that would fit in this uh, category. It is a Jezebel harlot attitude. Listen to this. Only let us call, be called by thy name. Oh, we want your last name. We want you to give us some uh, you know, prestige in the, in the community. We don't want to be law, known as lost people. We don't want to be known as pagans. We don't want to be known as wicked. We want to be known as Christians. Give us your last name, but we want to live our own way. And then he goes on to say, in order to take away our reproach. So no one will look down on us. So how can you look down on me? I'm a Christian. I named the name of Jesus. I took hold of that one man. And, and he goes on to say, and he makes a comparison in verse number two. In that day, I think it's the same day, shall the branch of the Lord, those who truly belong to the Lord, be beautiful and glorious, not rebellious, not brazen, not arrogant, not self-willed, not mean-spirited, not harsh, not, not carnal and crass and all those things, but she will be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Now, of course, we know it's Isaiah, so he's talking about the people of God in the Old Testament era. And he's just saying, you know, there's going to be those two groups of people. There are going to be those that look like, sound like, talk like, uh, maybe even make the claim. But then there are those that are really spiritually beautiful. They really are connected to me. My life flow is flowing through them. They are fruitful. They are abundant. They're glorious and they're beautiful to me. There will be a lot of others taking my name who are going to be selfish, self-willed, arrogant, prideful, lost, and in deep, deep trouble. So when I look at these verses, and I'm thinking about this, I ask myself, let's go back to verse 19 for just a moment. I ask myself, well, are there characteristics revealed here that would show whether or not I'm part of the beautiful branch or whether I'm part of that brazen harlot? Uh, uh, Jezebel spirit, rebellious against God. Remember, Jezebel was an Old Testament character, had no fear of God, no fear of the prophets of God, nothing like that. Matter of fact, she was she thought she, she was going to kill God's prophets, right? And she was so arrogant, but yet she's the one that was tossed off the wall and eaten up by the dogs, right? So, so there is that spirit that's going. So, I, so I'm thinking about is there characteristics, are there indicators in the New Testament? Particularly in this verse, these verses, 
Are there indicators that would show whether I'm genuinely a child of God or not? Now, don't hear me wrong, because I know there are people out there, and I know of one individually who will say, no matter what, I'm teaching salvation by works, or at least I lean that way. That is not the case. I'm talking about these are evidences that you are born again. They don't save you, but once you're saved, these are some characteristics you might have in your life. And I see them right here. Notice, first of all, works. Faith works. If you're truly born again, it makes a difference in the way you live your life. Amen. You don't work for salvation. You don't earn salvation. You don't earn and keep salvation by works, but you are born again. The Spirit of God moves in, changes you as a person. You become a new creation, Paul said, or new creature. And as a new creature, God begins to develop through the Holy Spirit kind of new attitudes, new behavior patterns. And next thing you know, God's remodeled your whole life, right? And you're really a different person. And it shows up in how you live your life. So faith actually works in us. It produces something. Remember James chapter 2 verse number 18 says, I'll show you my faith by my works. We're in the modern culture. They go, oh, James is teaching works salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, oh, look, my faith is so real, you can see it in the way I live my life. That's what he's saying. It, God has changed. My persuasion about God is so strong, I've changed my life. Or actually, He's changed my life for me as I've allowed him to live through me. Secondly, notice he says, I know your charity. If you're truly born again, you begin to love others genuinely. It shows up in your life. Uh, John 13, 35 says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples in that what? Ye have love one for another. Another indicator that you're born again is that you just love people particularly the people of God, because he's talking about that you love the brethren, right? But but I think it extends beyond that. God has loved us when we were unlovely. We ought to love people, even when they are dead in their sins, even when they are living wicked lives. We shouldn't wallow with them in that sin. We shouldn't act like that's love, but we ought to love them enough to teach them the truth, remain engaged with them to try to lead them to salvation in Jesus Christ. We should be people who love other people. Right? And Jesus says to the true church members here, I know your charity, not just your works, but I know your love. And then notice thirdly, if you're born again, service becomes part of your life. I want to serve God. God, what do you want from me? How do, how, how do I live my life so that I honor and I glorify you? He says here in this verse, I know your service. And the idea here, the word is the idea of selfless ministry. It's it's. God has given every single believer, according to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 18, God has given us all the ministry of reconciliation. We are all ministers in, excuse me, in that sense, and, and, and it ought to show up in our life. We ought to be willing to talk to people about God in order to help them reconcile their life with God so they might be saved one day and be able to enter into the kingdom of God. And really, that's why we do what we do. It's why we do fall festivals. It's why we do the, the care bath boxes that we do for the different places, the Christian Learning Center or uh, the Preg Crisis Pregnancy Center or whatever. All of those ministries are really designed to, to have a voice in people's life where we can show them the love of Jesus Christ, hoping that God will open the door that we might be able to minister to them or serve them in bringing them to reconciliation with God. And the only way that's possible is through Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. By being saved. And so all of our ministries, all of our activities are geared towards that. So a heart of service is another indicator that you've been born again. Now, I did not say that your service is what saves you. You did not hear that. No matter what, who tells you that, you did not hear that. And then fourthly, overcoming faith. Cling to Jesus. He says, and faith. Later on, he talks about overcoming in the, la in the last few verses of this section or this chapter. He talks about overcoming, and the idea is that we cling to Jesus. Remember, overcoming is that I'm going to work and work and work. I'm going I'm I'm to I'm I'm scratch my way into heaven. That's not overcoming faith. Overcoming faith is when I believe on Jesus, according to 1 John chapter 5, 
verse 4 and 5. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believeth on Jesus, those are the overcomers. So when he talks about this faithful overcoming or this faith here, the idea is that these are the people, in spite of the Jezebel spirit that has infiltrated the church, in, in spite of the worldliness that she's brought in and the worldly people that she has drawn into the fellowship, he says, I know that there are people there that understand that their only hope is in me. Cling to that. Hang on. And I'll deliver you one day. Amen. That, that's the idea here. So overcoming faith is clinging to Jesus faithfully, never giving in, never giving over, trusting him. And then he says, I know your patience. And that is the spirit of patience. Hebrews uh, 10, 36. This may be one of the things that most people never, ever think about in their life. That sometimes we just have to endure faithfully. We need to persevere. Hebrews says this. Chapter 10, verse number 36. Let me, let me quickly get there. If you're there before me, let me know. I'll let you read it. Chapter 10. And verse number 36 says this. One more page. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Most of us go through life saying, give me the promise, give me, give me, give me, give me the promise, give me the promise, give me the promise. A true believer says, regardless of whether I experience it in the moment or two weeks from now, ten years from now, or whether it's for eternity, doesn't matter to me at all. I'm willing to endure patiently knowing that in God's timing, I will receive his promises in my life. I don't have to always be on the upside. I don't always have to have the most goodies. I don't have to always be in the best position in life to show that God loves me. I mean, there's a whole gospel out there that teaches people that. If God loves you, you'll be rich. Right? You'll have big cars and big homes and boats and all that stuff. Well, that's not true. That's not true. Not everybody's rich in this world. Matter of fact, if you're rich in this world, that's where God warns you. He says, be careful, man. It's a lot easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for you to get into heaven. Didn't say they couldn't. It just says, hey, man, your riches will distract you and draw you away from me. Be very, very careful. But a true believer doesn't base his spiritual journey on his, on his personal momentary experiences. He knows that I can trust God regardless. Things good, things bad. Amen. Right? I can trust God. Things abundant, things lacking. I can trust God. That's a true believer. You get all those? Right? They're, those are indicators that you've been born again, that you are indeed a part of the family of God. And we're running out of time quickly. So let me just kind of introduce this thought. We'll come back next week and talk about the specific heresy in the church at Thyatira. See in verse number 20 to verse number 23. And I'm going to read it again. We'll close in prayer and we'll study it next week. Listen to what it says. Even though there is a church, even though there are truly born again people in the church of Thyatira, he says you got a problem. Right? Just talking real language. You got issues. And the problem with the modern church is we aren't willing to admit if we have any real issues, we're so corrupt that we want everybody to uh, dance with us in our corruption. And we're not willing to honestly look at ourselves. But here he says, notwithstanding, I have some things against you. I know that you're a working church. I know that you love people. I know you're involved in ministry. I know that you cling to Jesus alone. I know you're very patient in your experience. But you also have a tendency to allow other things to be develop. In a way, you are permissibly indifferent. That is a current church culture problem because we have taught nobody can judge, nobody can you know, measure things, and therefore we all have to be permissive in allowing others to be all that they want to be. And listen, that's an army slogan. That's not... That's not a Christian slogan, right? That's an army slogan. Be all you can be, right? That's not, that's, that's not something that God gave to the church. And here he's looking at this church and he's saying, 
You're indifferent. You have, and this word sufferest means you've, oh, sufferest means you've allowed it. You, you've just sat back and allowed this to take place. You've allowed that woman Jezebel. Now, maybe he's talking about a specific individual. Maybe he's talking about an attitude in general. I think it's a specific individual, but I think it has definite applications to an attitude at large. And I think we have that attitude bad in the modern church today. It comes along with feminism, I think, personally, but it's more than that. It is a spiritual attitude of self-will, self-determination. Yes, we want your name, but we're going to do it our way. We don't like the old-fashioned stuff, so we're going to create a new cart, and we're going to carry the ark the way we want to carry it, and we put our hand against the ark, and we're in trouble, right? It's God's way. It's God's way, not our way. And the, and the church needs to get back to the place where we are pursuing God, walking with God, loving God, fellowshipping with God, allowing God to work through us instead of the opposite of saying, hey, God, you, man, you're lucky the day I got saved. <laughs> Let me help you out. That, that just doesn't work. And yet that's the spirit of Jezebel. And the modern church has sort of just kind of permissively stepped aside and said, I can't say that women shouldn't be pastors. Although the scripture says that a, you know, an elder ought to be the husband of one wife. Yeah, well, she's, she's, oh, she's the wife of one husband. That's not what it says. It says the husband of one wife. Well, she's the husband, she's the wife of the wife. Well, that's even worse. Now you're talking about homosexuality and that's a perversion. I mean, you get what I'm saying. And we progressively stepped aside and said, well, you know, she says she's a pastor. She says she's a prophet. Well, what did he say? You suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess. And you let her teach. You know, the Bible actually says that men are supposed to teach women. Women can teach women, but a woman's not just supposed to teach a man. I mean, that's biblical. But it, people see it as archaic, and they don't want to talk about why. Because we got the spirit of Jezebel, and we say, hey, I don't care what God's word says. I know. God told me. I'm telling you what God. Well, the spirit's told me. Well, he won this Holy Spirit. You, you get what I'm saying? And yet we adopt all. You suffer her to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication by leading others into following her fellowship, she is causing them to commit fornication. And in this case, they were actually eating things sacrificed unto idols. Now, I'm not going to be so bold as to say that um, all, of the, all of the Jezebel spirit is feminism uh, in the church, um, but I would be bold enough to say that we are certainly headed down that path where, where ladies... You know, and I, I love my wife, and I thank God for my wife, and um, it isn't that I hate women, it isn't that I'm an ogre or anything like that. I just think the biblical model is God says that males should be leaders in the church, uh, pastors and deacons. I don't think women should be a deacon either. I don't see it in the scripture. But the spirit of Jezebel says, wait a minute, we name the name of Jesus, but we want our own clothes. We want, our, we want to do it our own way. You leave us alone. And the indifferent church goes, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. That's, that's not biblical. We'll talk about some of this next week, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to start in this, uh, continue in this study of Thyatira and the church of Thyatira. I pray you give us ears to hear and a humble heart that we might receive the truths that are meant for your church today. And God, I pray that um, in all that I have said and spoken of that have not gotten out of your will, but that have followed your spirit's leading and direction. And I pray, God, that that holy boldness would yield fruit for your glory and for your glory alone. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Another time of invitation. I know I didn't really preach a salvation message or join the church message, but if you're here and you need Jesus to save you, um, I want to invite you to you know, respond to the Spirit's leading in your heart. Or if you're here and you're already saved, you want to unite with the fellowship, you can come as well. Steve.